The Word of God is a sure foundation that has stood the test of time. Sadly, millions have built their religion on the ever-shifting sands of human opinion. Jesus warned only those who anchor their faith on the unchanging rock of His Word will stand through the coming storm. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to this revival series entitled, Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Pastor Doug Batchelor, speaker and president of Amazing Facts, has been reaffirming the fundamental Bible teachings upon which our faith is founded. I'm reminded of the story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7, where he spoke about two men that built houses. You remember that story? And Jesus said the one man built his house on the rock. And when the rains came and the floods came and the wind blew, that house stood firm. The other man, Jesus said, built his house upon the sand. And when the rains, the wind, and the floods came, that house fell, and great was the fall of it. We want to make sure that our faith is firmly grounded upon the rock, Jesus Christ, so that when trials and difficulties come, our faith will endure. Well, tonight, Pastor Doug Batchelor's sermon is entitled, The Rich Man and Lazarus. But before we invite him to come share with us, John Law McCain will lead us in our theme song again for this week, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Amen, friends. Let's stand together as we raise our voices to the glory of the Lord, announcing that our foundation is the sure foundation, Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within. Why does it hold? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Tonight, our prayer will be brought to us by Jacob Callahan. He's a ninth grader, and so we're going to kneel together on the platform, but let's remain standing as we come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that everyone could be here this evening, and please be with, Lord, please be with Pastor Doug as he brings us the message this evening. And Lord, may it not be him speaking, but you speaking through him. Um, Lord, we ask your presence to come and be upon us that we may receive a blessing this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good evening, friends. Good to see each of you here. And again, I want to extend a special welcome to those who are watching across the country. Some are in their homes, some are gathered in churches around the world. And we're getting your messages. I, I personally want to thank you for the very kind comments that have been coming in. Uh, some have been coming into my personal email and our website, and we won't have time to respond to all of your, your comments and your questions, but we're gonna do our best. And continue to pray. I believe that there is no substitute for the prayer of God's people. And this is a time for us to claim that promise that if God's people will humble themselves and pray and seek His face, and turn from their wicked ways, then God will hear, He'll forgive, He'll heal. That's a wonderful promise. So by the way, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Now, Pastor Ross, hi, how are you? Good, thank you. We got some exercise today, so we feel better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we got some questions as well that we need to look at. Last night you spoke about what happens when a person dies, and so there's several questions. As a matter of fact, you said that there was one question in particular that folks had to write down and ask, and it has to do with the thief on the cross. 
All right. When you share the truth about the subject of death, it's uh, almost um, expected that someone is going to go to that verse. It's found in Luke chapter 23, and it starts, I suppose, with verse 39. If you want to look in your Bibles, telling about two thieves that were crucified on the right and the left of Jesus. In verse 39, Luke 23, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not fear, even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And people say, well, there you have it. It says right there that today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, first of all, keep in mind, there is no punctuation in the original language. When the Bible translators of the varying translations look at these verses, they need to decide where to put the punctuation in. These are Bible translators. I could uh, write my own version, call it the Bachelor Bible. Anyone can make a translation. The King James translators chose to put the comma before the word today. Verily I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. But the way it really is supposed to be translated is verily I say to you today. I'm making a promise today. Today, even though I don't look like a Lord and a King because you called me Lord and you say I've got a kingdom, I'm going to make you a promise today. You will be with me in paradise. Now, you might say, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Doug, but how do you prove that? Because Jesus did not go to paradise that day. All you've got to do is keep reading. You go to John chapter 21. It tells us that when Christ rose from the dead, Mary lunged for him, grabbed his feet to worship him. He said, do not detain me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, and that's Sunday morning. So how can the thief be with Jesus the day, Friday afternoon of the crucifixion, if by Sunday morning he still hasn't been there yet? Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes a big difference where you put the comma. Yeah, I always like to share this quick story. Years ago, before they had telephone and email, people used to communicate with, uh, what do you call it, Western Union. And they'd send messages word by word you'd pay, letter by letter. And this ma wealthy man in New York, his wife went on a trip to Paris, and she sent him a telegram and said, found a beautiful fox coat, would like to buy it, $2,000. And he, I almost said emailed, he telegrammed her back and said, no price too high. So she gets off the boat after her vacation. Her husband comes to meet her and she's sporting this new fox stole. And he said, is that the coat you were talking about? Yes, don't you like? He said, I told you, no, price too high. <laughs> but he was trying to save money. He left out the comma or put it in the wrong place. And so he got the whole wrong impression. It makes a big difference. You know, another thought about that verse, Pastor Doug, the thief was not expecting to go to paradise that day. But he said to Jesus, remember me when you come, come in your kingdom. Yeah, exactly. He's looking ahead. He wasn't expecting paradise that day. Good point. Our next question, dealing with the uh, same topic, what are the souls under the altar spoken of in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9? All right, now, first of all, please remember, Revelation is a book filled with all kinds of very creative, some wild symbols and images, and they are largely symbolic. But when they're opening the seals, it says here in verse 9, he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? All right, first ask this question. Are we taking this literally? Or are the souls of all of those who have died for their faith, are they all crammed under the little bitty altar? Do you know how big that altar was? Uh, on earth it was, what, you know, 10 feet by 10 feet or so. It wasn't that big. And they're all crying in heaven? Would that be a very happy existence? No, this is, if you want to understand this, you go to the other verses in Hebrews, and even Jesus refers to the blood of Abel. Hebrews says, the blood of Abel, Jesus, uh, the Lord says in Genesis also, 
The blood of Abel, your brother, cries out for justice from the ground. Does blood cry or is that symbol? a symbol? It's saying justice is crying out. And these souls under the altar, it means God has got a record of those who are under the blood of Jesus. The altar is where the blood was shed. They are under the blood of Jesus. They are saved and he has not forgotten them. They will be vindicated. All right, the next question has to do with the same subject. What does 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 mean when it says, He will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus? All 1 right. Thessalonians 4, verse 14. One of the famous verses dealing with the second coming is 1 Thessalonians 4. And we'll read verse 13. But, beloved, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, that you do not sorrow as others that have no hope. First of all, what is Paul calling death? Sleep. It's all through the Bible. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will, notice, bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And people stop and they go, aha, see, they're there with Christ now. He's going to bring them back with them. You got to keep reading. People stop and they pull things out of context. For we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed. Now he's talking about a sequence here. Those who are asleep. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Now where are the dead? The dead in Christ, they're in the graves. They will rise first. He's talking about a sequence. So as the Lord sweeps around the circle of the earth at His coming, He doesn't touch the ground. We're caught up to meet Him in the air. That's why many people call it the rapture. While we don't believe in the secret rapture, we believe that we are caught up to meet the Lord. And we have a subject on that later. So the Lord sweeps around the earth. The dead in Christ rise first. They're caught up to Jesus. Then we who are alive and remain are caught up to join them. So when Jesus comes for us, they're with him. That's all he's saying is that the dead in Christ go first. By the time we get there, they're with him. That's all he's saying. Okay, very good. Let's change gears a little. You spoke about the Sabbath a few nights ago and we had some questions coming dealing with the Sabbath. The first question, what type of dress should a person wear to church on Sabbath? Uh, that is a legitimate question. Um, first of all, I think that because it's a holy day and you're coming to worship a holy God, and especially if you're going to church where it's a place that is dedicated to His service, that we should be respectful in our attire. Now, it varies from country to country. You know, when I go to the Philippines and I preach there on the Sabbath, they give me these very formal barongs. And when I was in India, they were so happy when I wore one of their traditional shirts and it was their clothing of respect. And so you will want to wear what you can. Now, obviously, if a person is poor and all they've got is one set of clothes, the Lord wants you to come just like you are. But what I do have an issue with is in our culture, people dress up for their boss and their job all week long and they go to church like they're going to the beach. For God, they don't have the same respect they've got for their employer. Well, they say, well, I might lose my job and my income or I won't get the raise if I don't, you know, dress up for my job. But they don't have the same kind of respect for God. And so I think that you ought to remember he's God and there should be, it should be modest, it should be clean, and it should be respectful. All right. Someone another. say amen. Come on. Am I right? <laughs> I believe it whether you agree with me or not. I still think it's true. But I'm hoping I'll get some assent. Amen, Pastor Doug. Here's another one. Is it okay to attend a wedding on the Sabbath? Well, you know, obviously weddings, holy matrimony, it is a, a holy event. It's a sacred event. Uh, I would try to avoid that because for one thing, there's so much preparation and <laughs> sometimes it's even a little stressful for people, a wedding. And, you know, there's so many other days when a person could do it. I wouldn't recommend. Uh, there's no example in the Bible of people conducting a wedding on the Sabbath day. Uh, and it's one thing, now, you know, the Bible says on the Sabbath, thou shalt not do any labor. And I had to give my wife a hard time because I, one of our boys was born Friday evening or she, and she went into labor on the Sabbath. I said, dear, you got to wait. <laughs> thou shalt not do any labor. I mean, some things you can't avoid, but you can pick the date of your wedding. Amen? So why would you want to do it to create all of that preparation and work on God's holy day, day of rest? Okay. And then I think our final question for this evening. What about the Old Testament feasts that we read about in the Bible, are they still binding today? Good question. Uh, you know, I briefly alluded to the Old Testament feasts. There's obviously a clear distinction between the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments. 
and the ceremonial Jewish holidays or feast days. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments goes back to creation before there was sin. It was something for Adam. It was something that you find in the very beginning written by God's finger in stone. The ceremonial Sabbaths were written on paper. A matter of fact, you know, our subject tomorrow night, we're talking about the sanctuary. We're going to talk about the ark and some of these things. I'll, I'll fill in a little more on that. But very quickly, the Bible says Christ is our Passover. When Jesus celebrated the Lord's Supper, it was a Passover service. He made radical changes at that time into a new economy. Do we sacrifice lambs anymore like they did with the old Passover? No, it's the Lord's Supper now. And you may not do it once a year. It could be done uh, many different times. He said, as oft as you do it. And so since we don't have the literal grape juice and the lamb anymore, I'm sorry, uh, it's, uh, or, uh, you don't have the uh, sacrifice of the lamb anymore and the literal Passover, it's symbolic now. Christ is our lamb. Uh, obviously, things have changed. And I'll talk more about that in our study tomorrow. Welcome once again, friends, to Here We Stand. This is a special series of meetings where we are going to be exploring some of the foundational teachings of Christianity that have been slowly eroding and in some respects totally lost sight of or been confused. Uh, many of these are also, well, I hope all of them are, the foundational teachings or some of the unique teachings found in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm inviting people to base their conclusions on what does the Bible say. Now, our message tonight is called The Rich Man and Lazarus. And it's based on a parable that is only found one time in the Bible. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to this parable, it's in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 16, and it begins with verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared or feasted sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those pass to us from there. Then he said, I beg you therefore, my father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I've got five brethren, that he might testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one should rise from the dead. Now that's the parable. Many people have read this parable, and it is one of the examples of why people believe or misunderstand the subject of hell. Now let me just tell you very quickly, one of the unique teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist movement is our understanding of the punishment of the wicked and the rewards connected with that. Uh, typical among many Christian churches is the belief that if you're good, you die, you go right to heaven. If you're bad, you die, you go where? Yeah, you go to that place. Sometimes we're not sure if we can say the word hell because in some contexts it sounds like cursing, but it is a biblical word. And there you will burn, and you'll burn forever and ever. And when people begin to learn what the Bible really says about this subject, they often run back to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, I wanted to start out by sharing with you what this does not mean, and then I'm going to talk to you and tell you about what it does mean. First of all, it is a parable. It's in a series of parables that Jesus is using 
to send a very specific message. One way that we know it's a parable, just ask yourself some simple questions. It says that um, the rich man was in torment and he was asking that his tongue could be cooled with a drop of water. Would a drop of water really cool you in hell? How much good would that do? I mean, if you've got a burning radiator, how much good is one drop of water? Secondly, it says that um, Lazarus died and he is carried to Abraham's bosom. Do we really believe that every good person that dies is whisked by the angels to a holding place somewhere on the bosom of Abraham? Is that literal or is that obviously a figure? Furthermore, do we believe that the people in heaven and hell are going to be able to dialogue through eternity? What kind of horrific picture would that be if the saved are able to look off as Abraham did and see the lost blistering in torment? Why did Jesus tell this parable? Well, first of all, let's explain the word that's used there for hell. It's, it's from the a Greek word Hades and it comes from Greek mythology. Now, when I was a, a young man, I went to public school among the 14 schools I went to and at one time part of our class was we participated in a play so we could remember Greek mythology and we were acting out the Greek gods and it fell upon me to play the part of Pluto, the god of darkness. And he was in charge of a place called Hades. You've heard the expression, the hounds of hell? There's all these misconceptions about uh, the subject of hell that have come from Greek mythology and medieval teachings that have twisted the truth on this subject. So when Jesus is beginning to share this message with the Jewish pe people, this parable, as soon as he says the word Hades, the listeners there understood he was speaking in metaphors. For instance, in our culture today, suppose that I should say, look, I want to tell you a story. One day, Alice was in Wonderland. Now right away, how many of you would know that this is not a literal story? Because in English literature, we all know the story of Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland. It's a fairy tale. So we'd never take it literally. They understood. They were acquainted with Greek mythology. They knew what he was saying. You know, so many people have spent so much time trying to explain what this doesn't mean, they forget what it really does mean. Let me tell you what it is talking about. That rich man represented at the time the Jewish nat nation. Today it represents the church. Feasting on the bread of life. While around them the Gentiles were starving for the crumbs of truth that fell from their tables. And yet it was the attitude of many in the church then as it is today we're God's chosen people, we've got the truth, let's feast. And on their way to church, they would walk by this poor beggar who would have been satisfied with the crumbs that fell from their table. And the only comfort he got was the dogs that came to lick their sores. You remember one time the Bible tells a story about a Gentile woman who came to Jesus and said, please heal my daughter. And he said, it's not appropriate to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. And she said, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs very same words that were used. And so when they die, surprise of surprises, Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom where every Jew wanted to be and the rich man, he's where he thought the Greek concept of punishment was going to Hades. And there's this tremendous reversal of roles. And so the rich man is saying, Father Abraham, the very fact he's saying Father Abraham shows there's a relationship, right? It's a symbol of the Jewish nation. Didn't Jesus say over and over, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And the children of the kingdom, the church members who aren't sharing their faith, they're in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. People miss the real message is a very sobering message. God has given us so many blessings in the truth in America, he's given us so many material blessings and so much of the world is struggling and starving for the crumbs that fall from our table. And the Lord is warning us that he gives us the blessings, whether they're spiritual or tangible, to share. Amen? Amen. That's the message. He's not telling us people in heaven and hell are going to talk to each other. And so, tonight we're going to talk about the truth regarding the subject of hell. 
And again, there is so much I've got to share, I can't cover it all. Wouldn't you know, there's even another website. There's a website, you can't miss this one, helltruth.com. Matter of fact, if you Google it, I think it's on the first page, it's very popular. Helltruth.com. That website's got lots and lots of scriptures and quotes and, and just theologians through history that know this truth from many different churches. And uh, we'll give you some of the evidence. Well, you know, I like to uh, incorporate some amazing facts when I, I uh, do my presentations. That's where we get the name Amazing Facts. If you go to California, down in Barstow, California, you can still see the remnants of something that, that is called a solar power tower. And what it is, is out there in that part of Southern California where the sun is very hot and it shines just about all year long, they built this, uh, looks something like a lighthouse, and they surrounded it with more than 1,800 mirrors that track the sun through the day, and they reflect the light of the sun as it moves across the sky to this one point on the top of what looks like the lighthouse, and it ends up being the equivalent of 600 suns, because these are like dual mirrors, pointing at that one spot. And it superheats that one spot so much that it ends up creating steam, and they use that steam to turn a generator, and they produce electricity from the sun. It was a pilot program by PG&E. They're shutting this one down. They're actually building a much bigger one now in Arizona, and they're looking at different methods for creating power from the sun and natural uh, sources. What a lot of people don't know is the initial idea for this solar power tower goes back to before the time of Christ. There was a brilliant Greek uh, engineer, inventor, scientist, mathematician by the name of Archimedes. And one of the many stories you can read about Archimedes was from 312 B.C., the Romans came to the besieged Syracuse, the city of Syracuse, and they turned to Archimedes to develop these uh, engines of war. And for years they thought that it was just a myth. But he developed what they, he, they called it Archimedes' death ray. And finally, the historian sort of concluded that probably what it was, it, it's probably a true story. What they said happened is when the Roman ships came into Syracuse Harbor, when they, whenever they got within bow shot, he would aim this death ray at the Roman ships and they would burst into flames and be consumed. Of course, it sounds a little bit like a myth, until some people began to do some experiments. And there have been three bona fide experiments, uh, one of them by MIT students. The other one was actually on, I think it's a program called Mythbusters. And they believe that all these soldiers took their shields, they polished these bronze shields, they, thousands of soldiers directed the sun all at one point, and he had some way of guiding them to one point. The Roman ships were uh, smeared with pitch which is extremely flammable, and if they attempted to come into the harbor when the sun was shining, they just burst into flames. And uh, I've even got some pictures here of the experiments that they did, and it shows where they did the experiments, and they actually did burst into flames. Now, our subject today is dealing with the subject of hell and the punishment of the wicked. The Bible does tell us in 2 Thessalonians that when the Lord comes, the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. But that's not hell. Some people have falsely accused Seventh-day Adventist Christians of not believing in, in hell. We very much believe in what people call hell or the punishment of the wicked. There is a place where the wicked do burn. Where there's confusion is when are they burning and what it is. A lot of mythology has come into the church over the years regarding this subject. Well, I'm going to go to question number one in our study, and uh, I hope you've got your pencils handy because uh, I think you're going to see a lot of references, and I want you to jot these down. Won't be able to cover them all. Number one, do people die and go right to heaven or hell? What does it say? How many lost souls are burning or being punished in hell today? I believe what the Bible says. If you look in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. When are they punished? What did, what did Peter say? The day of judgment. Has that happened yet? The great judgment day? 
No. That is still in the future. And if you don't believe Peter, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 48. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. When? Last day. The last day. One more time. Uh, question number two. When exactly will sinners be cast into hellfire? Has it happened already? How many of you know in the Bible, if you go to Mark chapter 13, you've got another parable Jesus told, and these parables are there for teaching principles. And it's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he talks about this man who planted good wheat in his field, and an enemy came and he sowed weeds. That's what tares were, and, and uh, they were finally separated at the end. And Jesus then explaining the parable, and you can't get mixed up if Jesus explains the parable, amen? Sometimes we try to take these things literally. We get mixed up. Christ explains the parable, and listen to what he says. Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. When? Say it with me. The end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they will gather together them which do iniquity, and they shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Does the Bible teach hellfire? Yes. yes. Are people burning in hellfire now? No. no. There are very few subjects in which the Christian church is more mixed up than this subject. So many people have got this idea that way down yonder is this cavernous place called hell. It's in the, you know, and some of the ancients, they could see steam coming out of the ground where there were geysers, and every now and then a volcano would erupt, not far from Rome, in fact. And the idea that they knew molten was down inside the earth somewhere, and they said, that's coming up from the devil. And, uh, and not only did they have these, these uh, fables about hell being down there somewhere, I mean, you know, the idea is if you're good, you go that direction. If you're bad, you go that direction, right? but their idea about the devil himself, that he's in charge of hell. So many misconceptions. I remember one day I was, um, I, I was checking out, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, I was checking out grocery store, and you know they get the supermarket tabloids that are there lined up, and I read the headlines, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you get bored and it's entertaining. And I'll never forget, I, I saw one, one. If you buy those magazines, don't tell anybody. <laughs> because your perceived IQ goes down 50% if you tell people that. But somebody's buying those magazines because they sell a lot of them. And one day I read this headline and it said, um, Russian oil drillers go too deep, break into hell, demons escape. <laughs> Something like that. And they got all these ideas that it's, you know, down there. All right, number three. Where are sinners who have died now? The lost who have died, where are they now? This is a big question. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all that are in their graves, where are they? In their graves. By the way, these are the words of Jesus. If you had a red letter edition Bible, I'd have them in red. Jesus said they're in their graves. He said it is coming. Does he say it happened yet? Future tense. They will hear his voice. Job chapter 21, verse 30 and 32. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, yet he will be brought to the grave and remain in the tomb. It, it, they're being held there. They are reserved. They are not burning in hell now. And I think this is so important for you to understand. You know how many people have been nearly driven insane? I'm sure some have been driven insane by the idea that some of their loved ones that died in a lost condition went right down to this place of torment. And maybe I should back up and refresh your memory on what the traditional view is among many Christians regarding hell. My father was a Baptist. First time I was baptized, it was Baptists that baptized me. And I know of what I speak. The idea was that if you die, you go down to hell. And what hell is, it is a place of burning sulfur and brimstone where you burn there in bodily form and soul forever and ever and ever. And some of the ancient preachers would wax very eloquent 
in describing the miseries of hell. And they talk about folks who are swimming through the molten fire, blistering and, and screeching in agony, and they would swim to the surface and manage to get their heads just above the bubbling molten brimstone, and they call out, Lord, how long? And he'd say, you've only just begun. And a million years later, they'd come back up and ask again. He'd say, you've only just begun. Terrible, terrible images. And now picture that, and then you have someone you love who dies in apparently a lost condition. That, that uh, could really be disturbing. It should be comforting to people to know, saved or lost, they're asleep right now. That's what the Bible teaches. Question number four. What is the end result of sin? Now this plays, the, these two subjects from on death and the punishment of the wicked go hand in hand. I talked about death last night. James chapter 1 verse 15. Sin, when it is finished, it brings forth what? Death. The result of sin is death. Yet some people say that the lost go to hell and they burn through ceaseless ages. Think about how long that is. A zillion years, theoretically, still screaming in agony, you just began. Can you imagine that? It's mind-boggling when you really think about it. It just should make you shudder. You know, I get excited about this subject almost more than anything else I'm going to be presenting, except for tomorrow night's subject, so you want to come back. <laughs> because before I, I was not raised a Christian, I did go to some Christian schools, and when I heard these things taught in those schools, I thought to myself, God is cruel. God is sadistic. I, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you that. I don't want to be disrespectful or blasphemous, but these are thoughts that I had. I thought, how can that be just to take these creatures that are all born with this natural propensity to sin? Let me see your hands. Anybody here, you don't have a natural propensity to sin? Okay. That's what the Bible says, too. We're all desperately wicked. Man, Job says we are prone to get into trouble like sparks go up. It's just in our natures. So we're born with this natural propensity to sin, and then God is going to take these creatures who, for whatever reason, do not capitalize on His grace, and then torture them through eternity. And I thought to myself, He's mean. He's cruel. He's a sadist. I hated God. And when I finally got that Bible up in the cave and I started reading, I was getting a whole different picture going through the Bible than what I was hearing pastors say. And it was liberating to me to find out God is love. That it is a beautiful truth. The, the reason I'm so excited about this subject is because it is defamation to the character of God to teach this false doctrine. And a lot of churches and pastors through history have used it to manipulate people through fear instead of the motive that Jesus used, which was love. It is a false teaching that is used to abuse people. John chapter 3, verse 16, there are two choices. Jesus said that whosoever believes in him should not perish. One of your options is what? Perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say you can choose between everlasting life in the fire or everlasting life in heaven, did he? You got everlasting life or perish. And in the Garden of Eden, what did God say to Adam and Eve? You will die if you disobey. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got two choices, friends. Moses, he said, I said before you this day, life and good and blessings, or death and evil and cursings. It's not eternal life in the fire, or eternal life in heaven. And you have all heard people make fun of even the teaching of hell. Some people said, you know, what? I, I got two choices. I can go to heaven, sit on a harp, and sit on a cloud, sorry. <laughs> sit on a harp, that hurt. I go to heaven, <laughs> sit on a cloud, and play a harp, and, uh, you know, be this chubby little fat naked baby, and the people got these mixed up. Or you can go party in hell. And they almost make hell sound like it's where all the wicked people are going to be. Oh, it's going to be fun. You've, you've, you've heard these cartoon analogies being made. And people don't understand you've got two choices, life and death. But everybody does suffer for their sins that are not forgiven and covered by Jesus. There is punishment. We'll get to that in a minute. 
that's why God said to Adam and Eve, if they disobey, that they would die. And furthermore, they were evicted from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 22. God said, lest man puts out his hand and takes from the tree of life and eat and does what? Lives forever. Now, I'll tell you why uh, this is so important to understand. When Jesus died on the cross, would you agree with me that he died for the sins of the world and he took the penalty for the sin? Of every sin you've ever committed, he took that penalty. How many agree with that? Yeah. All right. If the teaching of everlasting hellfire is true, how long did Jesus stay on the cross? Seven hours on the cross, two nights in the tomb, and he rose. If the penalty for sin is everlasting torment in sulfur and brimstone, how could Jesus say that he took everlasting punishment? No, the penalty for sin is death. Did he die? Yes. He suffered and he died, and that's going to be the reward of the lost. They will suffer for their sins, and then they'll die. Now, let's get to some other questions. I got so much to cover. Number five, what will happen to the wicked in hellfire? Answer, Psalm 37, verse 10. Get your pencil. I got so many scriptures. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. What's going to happen to the wicked? Doesn't see they're going to change uh, directions, or they're going to metamorphose, or they're going to be in a new body. Or It says they'll not be anymore. The wicked will perish. Into smoke they will consume away. Look at the words God is using regarding the wicked. Perish, consume, not be anymore. It's so clear. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 and 3. The day comes that will burn as an oven. Talking about that great judgment day Jesus spoke of. And all that do wickedly. How many of the wicked? This is the universal punishment of the wicked. All that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes will burn them up. And you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. The wicked are going to be destroyed. They're going to be burnt up. They're going to be ashes. They're not going to exist anymore. You know, some of you know the uh, story of Pompeii. I have been to the ancient city of Pompeii. It's right there near the base of Mount Vesuvius. It's interesting. I was just uh, chatting with someone tonight and talking about through history you can see a number of cities that have been destroyed for their wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah we'll talk about in a minute. You've got, uh, what did I say? Last night, Port Royal was just, the, it was called the wickedest city in the world. You've got Sodom and Gomorrah. You've got Pompeii. The Lisbon earthquake that took place. San Francisco earthquake. People said it was one of the wickedest cities. It was like a big bordello back when the earthquake hit. Now they're about ready for another one, aren't they? Sorry. I'm going to get letters on that. I'm from California. I take it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> They sort of have become a city that seems to embrace a lot of very uh, immortal views. Mount Vesuvius exploded. The people in Pompeii were covered with ash, and they were destroyed. A little amazing fact I, I'll share with you. The Roman soldiers that the legion of soldiers that led out in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple were later vacationing in Pompeii when the mountain blew up and many of them were killed because they were told to maintain their post. Revelation 21, verse 8, The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second what? Death. Is there hellfire? Yes. Are the wicked going to burn in hell? Yes. But it says they're consumed. They're burnt up. They'll not be. It is a death. It's not just the first death that everybody dies. This is the second death from which there is no resurrection. I heard a pastor say one time, if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. Everybody's born once, right? But if you're born twice, you only die once. Not just the natural birth. You need the spiritual birth too. Number six. Where and how will hellfire be kindled? Answers, Revelation 20, verse 9. At the end of the world, it's talking about when Satan gathers all the wicked to assault the city of God, the New Jerusalem, and they go up on the breadth of the earth 
and they encompass, they surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. So, to start with uh, the first part, is hell down under the earth somewhere? Or is that lake of fire going to be on the earth? God rains fire down out of heaven upon the earth. Same way it happened back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Proverbs 11, verse 31. The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked in the sinner. Hell is not another solar system. Hell is going to burn in Lansing, Michigan, among other places all over the planet. The Lord is going to baptize the world in fire. 2 Peter chapter 3 tells that. See, the Bible says, unless you're born of the water and of the fire, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born of the Spirit and born of the water, or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's talking about being baptized in the Spirit, being baptized in water baptism. The world was baptized in water in the days of Noah. It'll be baptized in fire when Jesus comes again, and then he makes a new heaven and a new earth. When God asked the devil in the book of Job, where did you come from? He said, I came from the earth, walking to and fro on it, not underneath the ground. He doesn't have a headquarters down in Carlsbad Caverns somewhere. <laughs> Number seven, how big and hot will hellfire be? The answer, I just was actually quoting this a second ago. Second Peter chapter 10, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens, and that's speaking about the atmosphere, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. By the way, when the Lord comes as a thief, don't forget that there's a great explosion. And the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Everything wicked, all the wicked works in the world, it's going to be burned up, I remember uh, just this last year, we had a very big fire in Northern California, and I was driving around in the hills up there by myself in a pickup truck, and I nearly got cut off by this fire. It looked like a nuclear bomb had been dropped in the Mendocino Forest. It was called the Hunter Fire, thousands and thousands of acres. And um, it's pretty intimidating. You get right up where I, you, I could look and see the forest fire right there in front of me. And it scares you a little bit. It puts a fear in you. His whole world is going to be consumed. God is going to use that fire to purify. Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15. It ultimately says, Death and Hades, or hell, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Not only is, are the wicked going to be burned up in hell, hell is going to hell too, according to what the Bible says. Hell, that's what the word it uses in the King James, is cast into the lake of fire. That means the grave. And anyone who is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Number eight, how long will the wicked suffer in the fire? Now, this is important because so many people have this idea of the everlasting punishment. Let's look at some verses here. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Now, do different people have different works? Yeah. Are there varying rewards for the righteous? Yeah. Yes, among the saved, Christ said that, you know, there's going to be varying rewards. Some are going to sit on 12 thrones around his kingdom. It doesn't mean that some people say, I'm going to be in the third heaven, you're going to be in the seventh heaven. That's not taught in the Bible. And God's not going to have, uh, you know, these kind of elevators in heaven. But there are varying degrees of rewards, and people may have varying numbers of stars in their crown. You've heard the song. There are varying degrees of punishment. But if everybody burns forever and ever, then it would seem that everybody gets the same punishment. And that would hypothetically mean that Cain, who lived uh, 6,000 years ago and killed his brother, one person that we know of he killed, if he died and he went right to hell where he's been burning for the last 6,000 years, he's been burning 6,000 years longer than Saddam Hussein or Adolf Hitler. That's not very fair. Matthew 16, verse 27 says, He'll reward every man according to his works. Again, in Luke 12, verse 47, 
The servant which knew his Lord's will and neither did according to his will will be beaten with many stripes. In other words, stripes, when someone got whipped, it left a stripe on their back. And that was the word they used for whipping or flogging. That's how they'd punish people. Those who knew God's will and did not do it, they'll be punished more severely than those who did not know. And that's the other verse. He that did not know and he commits things worthy of stripes, he is beaten with few stripes. So aren't you hearing the Lord say there are varying degrees of punishment? If everyone's being rewarded according to their works and everyone's got different works, I mean, suppose that some poor teenager, they've reached the age of accountability, they squander their life, they, they, they die in some lost condition. To punish them the same way, the same degree as Adolf Hitler? Uh, there's no justice in that. And the Bible says that God is just. Number nine, is hell going to burn forever? Will the fire eventually go out? Jude, verse 7, there's only one chapter in Jude. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah <clears throat> are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now here it's telling us in Jude 7, Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt with eternal fire. What does that mean? Well, we better go back in the Bible, take a fresh look at Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened there to understand it. You can read in Genesis 13, verse 13, that the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. It was a wicked, sinful city. God told Abraham he was going to judge the city. He couldn't even wait until they expired naturally. They were going to get early judgment because it was such an abomination. You remember that uh, the angels that came to deliver Lot and his family, the people of the city uh, essentially tried to rape the angels. And finally, the angels told Lot when he was lingering, trying to get his children out of the city, they said, escape. This is Genesis 19, verse 17. Escape for your life. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. What does consumed mean? Consume means to be devoured. What does consume and devoured mean? Cook Mexican food, invite me over. I'll demonstrate. <laughs> it means all gone. Genesis 19, verse 17. Escape for your life, lest you be consumed. And then the Bible says in verse 24, Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Now, I just saw a program on, um, uh, I think it was a History Channel, uh, two channels I sometimes watch are History and Discover Channel, and they were talking about the archaeological discoveries of the cities. Did any of you see that? You know what I'm talking about? Sodom and Gomorrah. They go right there, they've excavated and they can see that they all died suddenly. I've got a friend who was down there at that site and he came back, he said, furthermore, in the, the piles of ash that have covered these sites, there are little balls of sulfur. And you can take, I got one, I wish I brought it with me. You take these sulfur balls, they evidently were embedded into the ground and some of them didn't burn completely up and you can set them on fire. I've demonstrated it before. It just smells like rotten eggs, so I don't do that anymore. But uh, it does. But it's, it's the sight, they're there. Now the question is, the Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt with eternal fire. We just read that. Are they still burning today? Were the results of the fire eternal? Have there been any cities built where Sodom and Gomorrah is? Have they been rebuilt? There's nothing. It is desolate down there. They were burnt with eternal fire. Psalm 37, verse 10, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. The wicked shall perish. Verse 20, The enemies of the Lord shall consume, and to smoke they'll consume away. I think I already shared this one with you. Isaiah 47, verse 14, Behold, there'll be stubble. The fire will burn them. They will not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There'll not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before. Does it burn forever? Does it say that it finally goes out? Fire finally goes out. What does it say about Sodom? Genesis 19, verse 28, Abraham looked toward Sodom after it was uh, judged by the Lord, and lo, the smoke of the country went up like the smoke of a furnace. Now, don't forget this verse. Any of you ever seen fire, a big fire, and the smoke just goes up out of sight forever and ever? You hear me? 
I've seen it. I've seen some forest fires on a clear day where it looked like the smoke was just ascending up totally out of sight as far as you could see. Don't forget that. Some people have taken some of these verses, they take a few verses out of context and they twist the bulk of evidence to try and make it say something else. What about those verses, for instance, in Revelation 14, verse 11? It says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Well, we just talked about that. It's just saying that when the wicked are destroyed, their smoke ascends up out of sight. Are we going to sit in the city of God? Because the Bible says the new Jerusalem comes down to what? Earth. We can be sitting there on the walls eating popcorn, watching the wicked burn? Watching the smoke ascend up? What does it mean forever and ever? These verses have been misunderstood. Now, you've got to read a verse in its context. Otherwise, you can twist it. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, for instance. How many of you know the story of Jonah, swallowed by this sea monster? He's in the belly of this great fish three days and three nights, right? In Jonah's prayer, from the belly of the fish, it records, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Now I expect, have you ever thought about what it must have been like to be Jonah? You're in the digestive system of this sea monster down at the bottom of the mountains and it occurred to me one day that if Jonah was still alive in there, that sea monster could have been dining on other things before he swallowed Jonah. There could have been other critters in there squirming and spooking around. And I've seen some of these deep sea programs. I've gone diving at night where some of these sea creatures have bioluminescence and they can flash. Be in there with them jellyfish and shrimp, squid. Do you think it felt like he was in Hades? Do you think it felt like forever? Three days and three nights of that? But was it, is he still there? No, but he used the word forever. Matter of fact, you can find many, many times in the Bible when it used the very same phrase forever and it describes something that did have an end. For example, Exodus chapter 21, verse 6. Speaking of a servant who committed his life to his master, he'd go through this ritual and it said he will serve him forever. Well, what did that mean? Even in heaven or until he died? It meant he'd serve him until he died. When Hannah brought Samuel to the temple and dedicated her son to the Lord's service, He'll remain there at the temple forever. Question, is Samuel still there today? No, it meant for the rest of his life until he died. And again, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 28, as long as he lives. How long would Samuel be there? How long was that forever? As long as he lived. The word forever, in Greek, it comes from the word eon. And you ever heard someone say, I haven't seen them in eons? Well, it means forever. It's been, been forever. It's often used that way and you don't really mean a billion years from now. And yet people have taken that and applied it to the teaching of the punishment of the wicked and they've turned God into a tyrant and a sadist from twisting the scriptures. Forever and ever is a biblical expression which means until the end of the age. It's not necessarily an infinite, unending length of time. Oh, by the way, that's a quote from a commentary of a Christian, not a member of my church, but this next picture will give you some names and I forget who said it. Um, how many of you know Martin Luther? Father of the Protestant Reformation. He believed this way. Tyndale believed this way, who translated the Bible. John Stott, who's considered the father in England of the uh, evangelical movement in the world. He's about 80 years old this year. Good Christian man. He believes what I'm teaching. This is not a doctrine that is owned by the Seventh-day Adventists. All through history, many Christians have known the truth on this subject, that the wicked will ultimately be destroyed in the fires of hell. They don't burn there forever and ever and ever. Say amen. amen. Matter of fact, Donald Barnhouse on his commentary talking about Seventh-day Adventists. He said, we cannot fault Seventh-day Adventists for believing this because after all, many of the founders of the church believe this way as well. Number 10, what will be left when the fire goes out? Does it continue to burn? Answer, Malachi chapter 4 verse 3. It says, they'll tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, 
when the redeemed go forth from the new Jerusalem, after God's created this new heavens and this new earth, there's grass growing on the ground, and under the grass is the, uh, the wicked. The wicked who oppressed and persecuted the Christians will ultimately be ashes under the soles of our feet. And they're not going to be screaming, ouch, and, uh, you know, that hurts as you walk around. They're not conscious. Isaiah 47, 14, there will not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before. Speaking of the punishment of the wicked, they'll be burnt up and it goes out. 2 Peter 2, verse 6, turning Sod, this is another verse on Sodom and Gomorrah, turning Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterward live ungodly. So if we're wondering what is going to happen to the wicked, Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example of what's going to happen to the wicked, so we can understand this. Let me talk to you for a minute. A lot of people know what I'm telling you. A lot of Christians in other churches know these things. They recognize it. A lot of ministers recognize it. I was driving across Texas one time, and uh, I came across a car that was disabled out in the middle of a long stretch of country. It was a father and mother and two girls. I stopped to offer them help. I used to do mechanic work. Turned out that uh, their, their engine stopped because their battery was completely dead, not even enough to fire the spark plugs. I still remember it was Christmas Eve. Nowhere to go. Our home wasn't too far away. Invited this couple, stay with us. We'll see if we can get it fixed. I, I can check it out. Towed them. It was kind of pathetic because I had a Mazda GLC and I'm towing this big old Texas boat, whatever it was, so with my little Mazda. Towed them up to the house. And we, son, worked on the car, pulled out the alternator, found out what the problem was, but couldn't fix it right away. So they spent the night. And he said, Brother Doug, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a Baptist pastor. And I said, praise the Lord, I'm a Christian. And we began to talk about some of the differences. And um, in our time together studying, this subject came up. And I said, Brother so-and-so. I said, you know, how can you, I said, I know what Baptists believe. As I said, my dad was a Baptist. I said, how can you believe that the wicked are going to be burning through all eternity? I said, what about these verses that say that they're devoured, they're consumed, they perish, they will not be, it's the second death, they are destroyed. And he got real quiet and he looked down and he said, you know, Pastor Doug, I've seen all these verses and it's kind of been troubling to me. He said, but if I told my members that, they wouldn't come to church. That's exactly what he said. I said, brother, are they coming because they're afraid? I mean, fear is not all bad. And the Bible does say some things that should sober us up. Uh, I think if a person is on the way to destruction, they should not be at peace. I hope you're afraid. You ever read the book Pilgrim's Progress? There is part of the Christian message is to get up and flee from the wrath to come. We need to flee to that city of refuge. But you're running from what you're afraid of. You're going to the one you love. And those who go to church every week and they're afraid of God and they're, they, they resent Him, that's the wrong kind of fear. And yet so many people are being manipulated by religious leaders because of the misunderstandings on this teaching. I hope you go to that website, helltruth.com. I'm just covering the tip of the iceberg of scriptures that are there. There's just volumes and volumes of information. Number 11. Will the wicked enter hell in bodily form and be destroyed, both soul and body? Some people say, yeah, it's true that uh, the bodies are burnt up, but the souls burn forever and ever. Or people say, only the souls are put in hell. What did Jesus say? Matthew 10, verse 28. Catch this. How many of you believe Jesus? If you forget everything I said tonight and you believe this one verse from Jesus, it is so plain it cannot be misunderstood. Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. A lot of Christians were persecuted through the ages. Jesus said, don't be afraid of what they might do to your body. Stand for the truth. Amen? Amen. Say, here I stand on the word of God. You might be persecuted. Don't be afraid if they even torture your body. But rather fear him, meaning the Father, who is able to destroy soul and body in hell. Some people say, well, it's just the body that burns up, but the soul burns through ever and ever and ever, and that's not what it says. It says soul and body are burnt up. They're destroyed. 
If you were God and you're trying to communicate to humans what the fate of the wicked is, what words could you use other than what I've already used? Burn up, destroyed, second death, perish, consume, into smoke, not even warm anymore, shall not be. I mean, how much, you, if you're God and you're trying to make it clearer than that, what more could you say? Mark chapter 9, verse 47 and 48. Again, Jesus. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. It says you've got your body intact. The wicked are thrown into hellfire with their bodies. Having two eyes be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, I, I probably need to uh, stop at this point and explain that. Wait, well, Pastor Doug, it says the fire is not quenched. The word that Jesus used there for hell where he says it's better to, to go into heaven missing an eye or missing a hand or a foot than to go into Gehenna. The word he used is Gehenna, where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. He also uses that same terminology in Isaiah. Outside of Jerusalem, first of all, is anybody going to heaven without an eye, a foot, or a hand? Okay, so right away, what does that tell you about what Jesus is saying there? He's illustrating something. Right outside of Jerusalem is a valley called the Valley of Hinnom. That's the exact word that Jesus used there. Better to go into heaven, missing an eye, hand, or foot, than to go into Gehenna with your whole body. It was the dump. It was a deep, very steep area. It wasn't convenient for building because it was so steep. Outside Jerusalem, still there today. They filled in it over the years. It's not quite as steep now. And they used to throw all of the unclean animals that died and the broken baskets and the, the pottery and the garbage and it was full of dead carcasses and uh, animals and things they didn't want to bear. Just, it was putrefying so they tried to keep it burning. It was full of worms and it was smoldering. It was the most objectionable place around the city, the city dump. I remember I used to drive around Texas and every 10 miles they they have a city, and every city had their own dump, and people used to burn their trash, and, and they'd go out, and sometimes the trash wasn't completely, the fire wasn't out, and they'd dump their trash into the, the dump, and it was, they were always smoldering, always burning. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you live by these town dumps? Yeah. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the exact word he used. But what about the phrase where it says unquenchable? Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And people say, see, fire never goes out. All that means is that there's nobody extinguishing. To quench means to extinguish. It's the, a verb for that. No one's going to be extinguishing the fires of hell. Jeremiah 17, 27 is an ex a good example of this. If you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and to bear, not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I'm going to kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Jeremiah foretold the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and part of the, one of their sins was they were being sloppy about Sabbath keeping. Did it happen? It did happen. Was Jerusalem destroyed? Yes. Did they burn it? Yes. He says it was going to be burnt with fire that was not quenchable. Did anybody quench it? No, it burnt until it burnt it up. Is it still burning today? No. Is that clear, friends? Amen. It just means there's no firemen running around in the lake of fire extinguishing things. Nobody's quenching it. Matthew 5, verse 30. Again, Jesus said, It is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So it, it is the whole body cast in hell. Ezekiel 18, verse 20. Not only does a body die, but it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Is that clear? Soul and body die. Number 12, will the devil be in charge of hell? <laughs> There's so much mythology on this subject. How many of you have uh, heard these stories before about the devil? You know, he's in charge of hell. He's got the horns. He's red. He's got the red leotards, the tail with point on the end, and he's holding a, a pitchfork or a trident or something like that, and he's in charge of hell, and he uses the pitchfork to make sure people are cooking evenly on both sides, I guess. I'm not sure what that's for. Could you trust the devil? 
to be in charge of hell to make sure people get fair punishment? Equal opportunity punishment? And that's like putting the fox in charge of the chicken coop. You can't do that. And all of these medieval ideas about the devil that came from Pluto and Greek mythology. You don't find one place in the Bible that says that he's got a pitchfork and horns and leotards and bat wings and a goatee. I grew a goatee once because I hate shaving. And I had to shave it off because people said you look like the devil. <laughs> Just because of these, you know, where does it say he's got a beard? They called me a sinister minister. <laughs> I hate shaving. And so there's all this mythology and the same mythology about the devil has stuck with hell. It's still in the church today because well, religious leaders can exploit it to get a little more offering or to pay for someone to get out of purgatory. You listening to me? It's not true. Revelation 20 verse 10, devil's not in charge of hell. That's where he's going. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Ezekiel 28 verse 18 and 19, it says, speaking of the devil, I'll bring thee to ashes on the earth in the sight of them that behold thee, and never shall thou be any more. If anybody deserves to burn forever, who is it? It's the devil. But even Satan is going to be burnt up. And it says he's going to burn day and night. I mean, he'll burn longer than anyone else. If everyone is rewarded according to their works, who deserves the worst? The one who instigated the whole rebellion, right? So we don't know how long Satan's going to burn, but it's going to be longer than Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Revelation 20 verse 15, and whoever was not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Do we believe in hellfire? Yes, here it is. It's going to burn on the earth after Jesus comes and judges the wicked, and we've got a subject on this. What is the real purpose? Number 14, what's the real purpose for hellfire? Is it so God can get even with people that didn't accept Him? You better love me or you're going to get it. Is that how God gets our love? No, that's, that's not how you get love. It's prepared for the devil. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Who is it prepared for? For the devil and his angels. Revelation 20 verse 9 says, They go up on the breadth of the earth, and they come past the camp of the saints about, and fire comes down from God out of heaven, and it devours the wicked. It consumes them. They're burnt up. It's the second death. Does the Lord enjoy the work of punishing the wicked? No, it's one of the hardest things in the world for Him to do. It breaks His heart. Number 15, isn't the work of destroying sinners foreign to God's nature? The Son of Man did not come to destroy, but to save. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but He wants all to come to repentance. The Lord wants to save as many as He can. Isaiah 28 verse 21, the Lord shall be wroth that He might do His work, His strange work, and bring to pass His act, His strange act. This is so contrary to God's nature. We had a dog this last year. We've had for 16 years. You know where I'm going, don't you? Her name was Candy. Belonged to our son that we lost. The dog lasted longer than our son. And so it was really, really hard when Candy got to the place where she, we, we just couldn't bring ourselves to do it. But she finally got to the place where she just was dragging herself around. And uh, I mean, that dog had a good life. Um, ran free on some property. When she was thirsty, she drank. When she was hungry, she ate and just had a dog's life, as you would say. But this year, I had to do something about that. And it broke my heart to do it. And that's a dog. How do you think God feels about dealing with the creatures made in His image? It's a strange act. There's certainly no justice in the idea that people are going to be tortured through all eternity in hellfire. When I lived up in the mountains in the cave, my cat caught a mouse one day. I was cooking my dinner. And you know, cats are sort of sadistic, aren't they? And they don't just kill it and eat it. They like to play with their food. And it caught a little kangaroo rat. The poor thing was so dazed, he'd catch it, let it go, catch it, let it go. And, and one 
desperate final attempt to bolt for freedom, the thing hopped into the fire. Listen to you. You all go, oh! And remember, I'm talking about a rat. There's not a person here that can bear to think of a rat burning for three seconds. And yet, what do we put on God when we say that He's going to do this to His rebellious children through eternity? Ezekiel 33, verse 11, the Bible says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the what of the wicked? The death of the wicked. What are the two options we all have, friends? Life and death. We don't have any other options. It's come to Jesus and get everlasting life. If we neglect that opportunity, our option is death. Luke chapter 9, verse 56, Jesus said, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. If He just wanted people to be destroyed, He didn't need to come at all. We're all under a death sentence. He came to save us from that. You wouldn't do it to your dog. You wouldn't do it to a rat. And Job asks this penetrating question. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Are you more loving? <laughs> We're all selfish sinners. Are we more loving than God? Mortal man, we wouldn't even do this to our animals. And yet people are painting God with this doctrine. What are God's plans for the earth and his people afterward? Praise the Lord, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Nevertheless, according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Do you want to be part of that new heaven, that new earth, friends? I'd like to invite John to come and to sing for us, and then I'm going to make a final appeal, and I want to pray for you. I hope that you'll digest the things that we've said tonight before we close. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me. tonight, through my enthusiasm, you realize the news about hell is really good news. God is a God of love and He wants to save us. He wants to give us life. He wants to bring us to a world where there is no more death, no more sorrow, and don't forget this, no more pain. He didn't just say no more pain in heaven, no more pain in, in the whole universe. There's no more pain. That means there's not some torture chamber out there somewhere. God is going to make all things new. How many things? That means there aren't any old sinners being tortured through eternity. All things are new. The universe has been purified because God is good. God is love. This is good news, friends. And He wants to give you that new life. He wants to give you that kingdom. He wants you to be in that new heaven and that new earth that He's going to make. This is good news, friends. Have you made a decision to say, Lord, I, I think I can love you now. This has been a problem for me, understanding this subject. And I realize I've got two choices. It's life. He that has a son has life. Or it's death. Either your sins are all covered by Jesus, or we will suffer for our sins in that lake of fire. That makes me shudder. I, I've only got one good option, and it's Jesus, friends. I hope you'll choose Jesus. Is that your desire? Let's pray. Loving Father, Lord, we thank you for the good news that you are a God of love, a God of justice, a God of mercy. 
And I pray you'll be with each person watching, that they will choose now to invite Jesus into their hearts, and that they can look forward to that day when they'll be in that kingdom where there's no more pain or sorrow or death. Lord, I pray you'll continue to bless this series, bring the people, and pour out your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Now, don't forget, please go to that website. That is helltruth.com. I know you've got questions. We want to answer them. Tomorrow night's subject is the cleansing of the temple. You're going to hear some things you've never heard before and the good news about the temple of God and the people of God. God bless you, and we'll see you then.